Good morning and welcome to Ohio EPA's 2022 Virtual Compliance Assistance Conference. My name is Jessica Dalzell and I'm with the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance at Ohio EPA. I will be moderating today's EBIS session for NPDES permit holders. Ohio EPA's 2022 Virtual Compliance Assistance Conference has 24 sessions over two weeks. Today we have three sessions focusing on NPDES permits. Registration information and the conference agenda are located on the Ohio EPA's conference webpage. Before we get started, we would like to point your attention to one of today's environmental fun facts. Did you know that Ohio EPA's construction stormwater program is designed to permit and document construction activities in the state and require practices that keep pollutants out of the streams? More than 2,000 construction stormwater general permits are issued each year regulating an average of 20,000 acres of disturbed land. The general permit requires the use of erosion and sediment controls to protect Ohio's water resources. You can scan the QR code on this slide to learn more about Ohio EPA stormwater programs. And now I will introduce today's presenter, Donna Desois from the Division of Surface Water. Donna began working as an Environmental Specialist II at Ohio EPA Division of Surface Water in 2019. She divides her time between assisting customers in accessing and reporting through the eBusiness Center and with compliance activities, including the upload and management of Ohio EPA's data into the US EPA's database. Prior to transitioning to Ohio EPA, Donna worked as an environmental control supervisor in Florida and for 20 plus years in California, supervising and managing environmental compliance and pretreatment programs. And Donna, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Jess. Good morning. Today, I'm going to talk about two different services specific to the Division of Surface Water. The first one is streams. This is the service used for electronic submittal of applications, not just applications for new permits or renewals, but if you want to transfer, modify, or terminate a permit, this also requires an application, and you can find those here. If there are any permit fees, you can also pay those at the time you submit an application. Streams is also used to create and submit reports. This is other than DMRs, which brings me to the second service that I'm going to talk about. EDMR service is used for the electronic submittal of analytical data. This is for sampling required by your NPDES permit. So who uses the eBusiness Center and these services? Anyone that needs a permit, has a permit, or submits information required by a permit will use these services. This includes, but is not limited to, all of the groups that you see on this slide. So before we get started, I want to spend a minute covering the term legal permit holder. This is also known as a responsible official, and you'll see me, you'll hear me say RO throughout this presentation. We get a lot of calls on this. The term responsible official doesn't have the same meaning in streams and EDMR as it does for other services. The term is defined by the regulations, which specifies certain title and responsibilities owner, president, CEO, or elected official, meaning the mayor or village administrator, council member, these are considered the legal permit holder. And as you can see, there can be more than one RO for a permit. In almost all cases, the RO is not an operator, a consultant, or an employee. So even if you've been hired to manage a treatment plant or to submit reports, the legal permit holder is ultimately responsible for compliance. They are the ones that need to make sure that they hire qualified people to gather and submit the information, that the information is true, accurate, and complete, and that all violations are corrected and reported. And you'll see this in the certification statement that comes with every document that's submitted. So now we're gonna take a quick poll so who can submit an application? An operator, a consultant, or the owner, corporate official or elected official? I'll give you a minute to answer those questions. Thanks, Donna. That poll has been launched, so please select the appropriate response and click submit.
I'll give it about 20 more seconds here. We have about half the votes in. All right, Donna, we'll go ahead and close this poll and I will share the results for you here. Okay. So trying to get back. Okay, it's not grabbing the slide. There we go. I don't have control for the next slide. There we go. So who can sign and submit? According to that poll, it looks like all of you are right on track, um, which brings us to our next topic of who can sign and submit. Applications have to be submitted by the legal permit holder, which is the RO. These can be completed by others, but if they're not signed by the RO, they will be kicked back as incomplete. This is why the responsible official also needs their own accounts and PIN. For EDMRs and reports, those can be submitted by anyone as long as the RO for the facility has provided Ohio EPA with a written request delegating privileges to that person and that request has been approved. Forms not signed by an RO will be denied and returned. Anyone submitting an application, a DMR, or a report will need a PIN. A PIN is equal to your signature. It's like a fingerprint and should not be shared. This PIN is obtained once you get into the eBusiness Center. It is not the same one that's used when setting up your OHID account. To obtain that PIN, your identity is verified by an outside system called LexisNexis. You'll create five security questions that only you can answer, and this verifies that you are the one signing. Those answers are also case sensitive. If you're having trouble, reach out before you're locked out. There are things we can do to help you so you don't have to submit a hard copy. So how do you get into Ohio EPA's eBusiness Center? You need two accounts and a PIN if you'll be submitting documents. The first step is to set up an OHID account. This is not Ohio EPA site. It belongs to the state of Ohio, and it's a completely separate system. You'll search for and add the eBusiness Center app, and then launch it and open it. If you don't already have an eBiz account, here's where you will create one. We also get a lot of calls on this, people trying to delegate um, applications and privileges and they can't find the other person's account, nine out of 10 times, it's because the other person only set up the OHID account and they didn't set up their eBiz account. It's important to know the email address should be the same for both accounts. It shouldn't be generic. Accounts are also person specific. They are not set up for a business. They should not be used by multiple people. And you shouldn't be logging in with a username and password left from the person that worked there before you. We have plenty of guides and resources available to help. Once your accounts are set up, they will sync together and you'll only need to log into OHID and open the eBiz app. If you have more than one eBiz account using say a different email address, this is gonna create issues for you when trying to find your applications and reports. And this is because these permits are associated with a specific eBiz account, and I'll cover more on that later. So how to use and navigate within eBiz. After your accounts are set up and you open the app, you're gonna land here on the eBiz homepage. But before getting into these services, I wanna cover a few things about this page. If you look at the top right in that black bar, you're gonna see your eBiz username. This might not be what you think it is. It might be an alternate ID that was assigned when you set up your OHID account. If you're delegating an application and the person can't find their username or you can't find that name that they gave you, have them check here. 
underneath that, you're going to see a green box that says need help. If you click on this, it's going to give you a ton of information. There will be links to frequently asked ask questions, fact sheets with contact information for each service, information on getting your PIN, and then contact information for the eBiz Help Desk. Over on the left, you see my account. If you click on that, it's going to give you a drop down menu. This is where you will go to request a PIN. You'll also have to come back here to view it and then back again to activate it. Your PIN is going to be eight funky letters, characters, numbers. It's your unique signature. If you forget your PIN, you can always come here to see it. You can also come here to see and make changes to your security questions. But keep in mind, if you're using an account that was set up by somebody else, you cannot make changes. You have to know the answers to those questions. Underneath that, you will see announcements. It's one of the many locations that we use to keep you informed of things that might be going on with the system. And underneath that, you will see available services. Streams is the sixth line down. EDMR is in the middle of the page. And then the service to pay fees is towards the bottom. So before getting into each of the services, I also want to go over our permit structure. And there is a handout for this. Each person should only have one eBiz account. You need to know your permit number. You have to tell the system which permits you want to associate with your account that you want access to. And you'll do this by adding each permit number to your account. It's not the other way around. You don't set up a new account for each permit. Ohio EPA's permit numbers start with a number. The number tells you the district the facility is in. So if you look at the map, this example shows that number one is the Southwest District. The second character is a letter. It indicates the type of facility. So if you look at that blue box, there are three main types. I is industrial, P means you have a public facility, and G is, means you have a general permit. That third character is also a letter which gives more detail on the type of permit, which you'll see there in the purple chart. Then you'll have some numbers that identify your particular facility, and you'll see that asterisk. After the asterisk is a letter, which gives you the version of the permit. A is the very first permit issued, B is the second, et cetera. Make sure when you're searching for a permit, you choose the current version. The bottom right hand of this slide shows the first page of the permit. Ohio EPA's permit number is located in the top right on this page. The US EPA has their own permit structure for numbering permits. And you'll see that down on, on ours, it actually says application ID, and they start with a capital OH. On a side note, when you get your permit, look at the expiration date. Applications to renew these permits are due six months before this date. Don't wait until the last minute to start the application. They do take time. So if you're not sure of your permit number or you want a digital copy, you can find them on Ohio EPA's website. And here are the links and the steps for that. I'm not going to go through all of the details, but that last picture on the right is going to show you a table for what the individual permits look like, which is a, the bulk of our permitted users. You can search by county, by district, by facility name. You can download a copy of your permit. And there's also a column that you'll see the word compliance. If you click on this, this is going to take you to ECHO, which is US EPA's website and stands for Enforcement and Compliance History Online. The presentation later on SNC will cover more about this and finding out the compliance status of your facility, but you wanna keep an eye on that and check and see where you stand for compliance issues. So where to find streams? On the eBiz homepage, Streams is about the sixth line down, and you click on the words to actually open the service. When you do that, the first time you open it, you're going to see this page, which is what we call your dashboard. This is where you'll see a list of facilities and permits that you have added to your account. To do that, you'll click on Add Facility or Permit, and you can search for that facility if it already has a permit. You will click Create New only if that facility has never been permitted before. On the top left there, you'll see a Home button. That will always bring you back to this page. 
in that black bar on the top right, that little teeny box with the diagonal arrow, that'll take you back to the eBiz homepage. Once you've added a facility or permit, you're gonna see that first picture on the left, which is a search box. Use the permit number to find the facility that you want. If you don't have it, there's a button that you can click on that says I don't have permit number and it gives you different search options. You can search by name, address, use the map as shown in the second picture. That third picture is how it will look when you find the permit and you wanna click select to add that to your dashboard. Once you've added a facility and you wanna complete an application or report, you have to click on that facility that you want to open it. If you no longer need that permit or you don't deal with that facility anymore, you can also remove it on this page. Note that some facilities have more than one type of permit, could be a wastewater permit, you might also have a stormwater permit. Each permit number will be listed, as you can see from that screenshot on the right-hand side. Find the permit that you want to renew or submit a report for and click on that little sideways arrow to open that up. When you do that, once it's open, you're going to see a header with a permit number and a table below it. Look at the effective dates, the expiration dates, and the status. You want to find your active permit. Ignore anything that says draft, that's for internal use. And the actions button, that is your friend. That's what you want. That's going to give you a drop down menu of choices. That's where you will select if you want to renew your permit, terminate it, make a change, or transfer it. Select the one that you want, and that will open that form. Click Create Report, and that will give you a drop down menu of all the reports available for that permit. Select the report you want, and that one will open. Now, again, this doesn't include DMRs, that's a separate service. Once that application or report has been started and it has been saved, the system will create an application section or a report section to house that document until you submit it. If you scroll down, you can go to that section, find the application or report you want, and again, use the actions button. You can choose edit, which will open that application or report, or this is where you'll go to delegate it for somebody else to work on. Once you open that application, it will populate with the information that we already have in the system. Before you start filling things out, scroll all the way down to the bottom. You will see buttons that say validate, save, submit, and close. You wanna save that form before you go back and start reviewing and updating the information. If you validate, if you choose that, it will check to see if anything's missing and you'll do that before submitting. Submit will actually transfer the completed document to Ohio EPA. And again, if you're not the legal permit holder, you cannot submit an application. So if you've created an application or report and you need to transfer it to the owner to submit or to someone else to work on, you need to complete the delegation process. You wanna make sure that that person you're delegating to has their own account and PIN, that they've added that permit to their account. And again, in this application section, that's where you'll go to the actions button and choose delegate. So now let's take another quick poll. If the owner of a facility hires someone to submit information and reports on their behalf, does the owner need to be involved? Yes or no? We'll give you a minute to answer that. All right, Donna, votes are trickling in here, so we'll give it another 10, 15 seconds, and then I'll turn it back over to you.
All right, Donna, the results are in. Okay, let me. Get back to my slides. It looks like most of you know that the legal permit holder still needs to be involved. Yeah, I'm trying to get, there we go. Which is good because the legal permit holder is still the one that's ultimately responsible for compliance and they can't completely absolve themselves. So once you've delegated the application, you will see this screen, or excuse me, once you go to delegate, you will see this screen. You'll enter the name of the person and you'll select search. You can select that person's account and you'll hit the delegate button. If this search doesn't find the person that you were looking for, this means that person has not set up both accounts. They probably set up their OHID account and didn't finish the process. It also could mean that they may not have requested a PIN or they didn't activate their PIN. You want to contact that person and have them check on each of these points above. Once the application is delegated and they have added that permit to their list, they can't skip that part, they can open the document and they can review and submit that information. So some general information about applications. If you're renewing your permit, once you open that form, you also have to select renewal. Make sure you click on the form instructions at the top right of each page. It will provide detailed information for each section. Please read the instructions for each section of the form before completing the information. If buttons are grayed out and you can't select them, maybe you chose the wrong type of application or it's based on the question before, Review the application you first submitted for the facility and make sure that your answers are coinciding um, with the permit that you had. If you answer yes to a question, you also want to make sure to complete any associated forms. So, for example, in that slide, if you click yes, go over to the right and in that column, there is another form that you need to click on to open up. That also has forms within it and attachments. So make sure anything that looks like you can click on it that you are addressing. Keep your eyes open for attachments within the application online. There might be attachments or information that are required in addition to the online form. You'll need to download a copy of the blank form and save it to your system to complete, and then you can upload it back into the application. If you have questions about the content, you need to check with your district inspector. Save it frequently and be patient. If you're too quick when clicking on things, the system may freeze, but it's actually trying to catch up with you. The buttons, the forms, they're not highlighted. It means you may have created a new application and it's a renewal. So it will give you the choices that you need to complete depending on the type of application. If you're still having trouble, reach out to us for help. I hear it all the time. I've spent weeks on this application and not gotten anywhere. There's no reason. We are here to help and there's plenty of resources for you to do that. So get in touch with us. The best thing to do is send an email with a date and time and we will get back to you. So due dates for fees and payments. When the applications are submitted, an invoice is created and your fees can be paid at that time. Many applications are good for five years. Check your permit dates. Renewal applications, again, are due six months before they expire, so plan ahead because late submittals are a violation. Again, there's plenty of resources and guides to help you. Here's the way to get to Ohio EPA's website. Under Featured Content, you'll click on the eBusiness Center. Under What Services Are Available, click on the Division of Surface Water. This will bring up many different types of guides that are available. I'm not going to go over specifics because we have so many, but if you click on the tab that says Streams Applications, it will expand. We have guidance documents that will walk you through step by step for what you need to do and what you need to look at. So now I'm going to switch over to EDMR service. Unlike Streams, if you want to submit a DMR for a facility, there are two ways to gain access. 
The first is online, and the second is by using a delegation of authority form. The very first step is to determine your role. Are you the responsible official or are you a delegated submitter? Either way, the process starts on this page by going to the EDMR line, go over to the right, the facilities column, and you will click on view edit. After you click on view edit, you're gonna see that first screen on the left. This is where you will select and manage your facilities. At the bottom, you'll see a list of facilities that you already have been approved to report for. You can also remove a facility by clicking on the red X in the action column. If you know you've been delegated to report for a facility and you don't see it listed, it might mean you didn't request or activate your PIN. On the right, you'll see the green, bu green button that says Add Facility. You're gonna click on that and it's gonna take you to that next screen shown here. You will search for the facility that you wanna report for. Where it says Regulatory Program ID, we are actually asking for your permit number for the facility. If you don't know it, you can just try entering the street address or the name. You don't need to fill in all the boxes. The less criteria you enter makes the search easier and then you'll click on search. This will bring you to the next screen on the left. So if you see the facility that you want, you're gonna click on the blue number where it says agency core ID, and that's going to bring up the screen over on the right. Then you're gonna click next. This is a screen where you'll check the box for the role that applies to you. So I'm gonna go over selecting responsible official first. You'll select RO, you'll read and agree to the certification statement. You'll sign your name by entering your PIN and answer your security question and then submit your request. Once that request is approved, usually within 24 hours for responsible officials, you can then go back to the homepage and delegate privileges to others to report on your behalf. The most common reason a service request is denied is that the title and responsibilities do not meet the criteria for a responsible official. If you select a delegated submitter, it's the same process. You'll read and agree to the certification statement, you'll enter your PIN, and you'll submit your request. The difference is if you select a delegated submitter, you have another step. You'll see this next screen. This is the delegation of authority form. This is generated specifically for you from what we have in the system. You can't make changes to these forms. This has to be printed and given to the owner or the RO for the facility for them to sign, have notarized, and they need to mail it in to us. The form can be emailed to expedite things. However, it still needs to be mailed. This is a federal requirement. You also will get an automated email with a copy of this form. Service requests will remain in the pending state until the form is received by Ohio EPA. The most common reasons these service requests are denied is that the person that wants DMR service signed the form for themselves, so it's not signed by the right person. The title isn't outlined, so we don't know who that person is, or it wasn't stamped or notarized properly. So accessing your DMRs. Once a request has been approved, you'll also get an automated email letting you know that you can now access those forms. You'll go back to that EBIS homepage and you will click on the EDMR service. That'll open the, screen, uh, the screenshot you see there on the right. Before you click on view reports and get to the DMRs, check this page. It's another location that we will give you announcements if, if something's wrong or if there's issues with the system. This is another location that you should check. So now getting into completing your DMRs. Here's where you go to complete them and use this search panel to your advantage. If you have multiple facilities, use that little triangle to select the facility you wanna report for. In the status line, you could check the box in the front. It shows you the types of DMRs that you'll see. If all the boxes are checked, it means all of the DMRs for all of the permits are gonna show in your table and that takes a long time to load. 
Check new if you just want blank DMRs, ones that are due. The exception to this is if it's a stormwater permit. If you click open, that's gonna show you DMRs that might've been started, but have not been submitted yet. So check new if you only wanna see the DMRs that are due and uncheck the other boxes. This is gonna make it a lot faster for the system to load because you're not asking us to pull up so many reports. You can also adjust the start and end dates for the monitoring period. Our system holds about seven years worth of data. Please go back a few years, look at the table, check the status column, make sure there are no new or open reports. You also wanna make sure that each report says submitted transferred to SWIMS. If you have a new or open DMR that needs to be completed, say maybe you don't have the data or you weren't working at the facility at that time, maybe it was another person, these reports are still outstanding and need to be submitted. You might have to use an A code if you don't have the data and we'll cover more on that later. But do not leave open DMRs. This causes violations and each one has to be submitted. You should have zero listed when you do that search. Presentation on SNC will cover more about open DMRs and violations a little bit later. So completing your DMRs. We're first gonna look at the top screenshot, which covers new reports. When you click on that actions button, it'll give you the options for new reports. You will choose edit report to open the online DMR to complete that form. You can also choose download XML or Excel which will open the DMR in a different format where you can save it to your system and then upload it when you're ready. Again, I recommend you create a folder and save these files. You can enter data as you go. You don't have to be logged in. The Excel format is much easier to use and it's easier for entering comments. And when you're done, you just copy and paste the data into the online forms when you log in to submit. An advantage of this, it allows you to keep your analytical data on your own system. So you've got historical information that will also help you when you go to complete the application to renew. This also gives you an option to download a PDF copy, which is a blank version of the DMR, which brings us to the second screenshot. So after your DMRs are submitted, you have another actions button, but the choice is gonna be different. It's instead of edit, it, you're gonna see view or revise report. When you click on that, you're gonna get the screenshot on the right. You can either choose to view the report or you can choose to make a revision. To revise a report, you've gotta click on that green tab that says revision. This is going to open a copy of the original that you submitted. The original is going to say locked due to revision. It's gonna ask you why you are making changes, keep your explanation short, and then you'll have to complete and submit the information again. This will give you the option also to download a PDF copy of the submitted report that has the information. Again, I wanna spend a minute on using the Excel format for the DMR because I encourage people to use this option. It has a lot of benefits especially if you have a number of different discharged locations and outfalls. Using the Excel format allows you to enter data as you go and you don't have to be logged in to OHID or EBITS. You can save this file to your computer. It keeps historical data. It is much easier to enter comments and you can copy and paste the data into the online form when you're ready to submit. So some tips for completing your EDMRs. On the left and the top of that screen, make sure you check that you have completed the information for each monitoring point or outfall. You wanna check the frequency in the table. If it's once a day, our system is expecting to see every box every day to have a piece of data or an A code. If it's once a quarter, make sure you have the one for that quarter and it's the right month. If it's the first quarter and it's January, February, March, you may be required to submit that DMR in March and sample in March. So check your permit. Bottom line, do not leave cells blank if data is expected. If you didn't dispose of any sludge, make sure you check the no discharge box. If there were no overflows, you wanna enter a zero. 
check your email. The system will send you an automated email, typically the next business day after the DMR was submitted, if there were compliance issues or violations. You need to notify Ohio EPA 24 hours in becoming aware of your violations. Check your permit. There's a non-compliance report form that you can also submit through streams. Make sure you use the proper A code for each situation and make sure you include a comment if it's required. Again, look at that top right-hand side of the DMR and make sure you complete each page. Sometimes there's more than one page and again, blank cells mean a violation. So I'm gonna cover a little bit about the A codes and this is a handout that's been provided. Most commonly used is the AA code. If an analysis shows non-detect for a sample you collected, you'll enter the AA and you have to leave a space and then put the detection limit that's shown on your lab report. Other examples are the plant maybe wasn't normally staffed, it was a holiday or a weekend. Um, that only applies if samples are collected daily and you'll use the AN code. Say your sample site was flooded or frozen over and it's not accessible, it's an AC code. There's a bunch of different codes here. Know what those are and when to use them. If, it's, if there isn't an A code there, if it's a reason not covered by one of these A codes, say your tech just forgot to collect the sample, that would be an AH code. That one requires a comment. Some of these codes require a comment, some do not. If you put in the code and don't put in a comment, you're gonna have trouble submitting. And just because you use a code, it doesn't mean you're in compliance. So if a comment's required by an A code, you're gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom of that page in the online form. You have to choose the correct column, the correct pollutant or parameter, and the correct date. Then in the box below that, you have to enter the reason and you wanna keep your explanation short. Don't hit the return key, don't hit the enter key, don't use special characters like less than, equal to, et cetera. And the most important piece is that you have to save this comment. You can enter all this information, but if you don't save it, you're gonna get errors when validating your report. So when you're ready to submit, you've entered all the data, when you get to this page, you can validate or check the report. Not all errors are going to be in red. Check the comments section. This is usually where the issues are. It's a space you added, maybe you hit the return key, it's a character the system doesn't like. Check those sections. After you submit, you'll get a message that says submission successful. Make sure you go back to your table in the report and check that the submission status says transferred to SWIMS. This is where you'll go to check. You'll be notified if there were any issues with the transmission. When it says successful, it just means that it's checking the format to see if it can be transferred completely to Ohio EPA. It doesn't mean it's already in our system. So let's take another quick poll. What does it mean when a field in a DMR is outlined in green? Data is valid for submittal, data is outside expected limits and you need additional info, or data entered is missing a decimal point. Thanks, Donna. And that poll has been launched, so you can go ahead and select your vote. Give it about 10 more seconds here. If you've not yet voted, please do so. All right, Donna, and I will turn it back over to you.
Okay, good. Um, I'm I'm glad to see that um, many of you need a little bit more information, and I'm glad that I have this presentation. Um, when you're validating reports and checking for compliance, those cells highlighted in green are actually a warning. It's telling you that that data is outside the limits that the database has for that parameter. It's outside what we expect to see or the range. So for example, if the range is 0.05 to 0.08 and you enter a result of 0.102, that exceeds the range and it might be an effluent violation. You wanna check your permit to know what that number is, but that's just telling you that there's something wrong. Cells highlighted in red, you cannot submit until the DMR, uh, excuse me, cannot submit the DMR until you address that issue. So if a cell is highlighted in red, check to see if a comment is required. Maybe you put in a code but didn't add the comment, maybe you didn't save it. Did you use the proper code? Is there a special character in there the system doesn't like or did you hit the enter key and there's a space that you're not even seeing? If your comments are too long, that's also gonna be an issue. Did you remember to use a space when you use the AH code? So validating your DMRs, it does not check for compliance, so to speak. This is checking to see if there are blank cells or errors that will cause problems with the transmission of the form. You are responsible for knowing if there are any violations and reporting them. Remember, you become aware of a violation when you get the data from the lab, not when you enter that data into this form. They're not just numbers. Pay attention to the number that you're entering and do not wait for Ohio EPA to notify you if there is a violation of your permit. Again, you have to notify us within 24 hours of becoming aware and you actually become aware when you take that reading or enter that data. So tips to stay in compliance. Again, late and non-submittal of DMRs, it's our biggest group of facilities in SNC. These DMRs are created on the first of every month. They're not due until the 20th. That gives you almost three weeks to enter your data. Do not leave cells blank. Submitting all outstanding DMRs and reporting effluent violations, that needs to be done as soon as you get those results, as soon as you know. So plan on sampling early so you get your data back on time. Set a reminder for your calendar, your phone to enter your data. Use the Excel option. You can get that the first of the month when the DMRs are created. You can fill it in as you go and you don't have to be logged in, which saves a bit of time. There's no reason to be late with these reports. If you aren't in compliance, you can also file that non-compliance report through streams under Create Reports. And again, if you need help, don't wait weeks or months before reaching out to us, please. We can help you. We do it all the time. Um, if you have questions about streams or EDMR, we've got a, a shared mailbox that a number of us look at and we'll get back to you. Best thing to do is send us an email with your uh, a date and time you can be in front of your computer because we know a lot of you are out in the field and, and you're not always there. So we can set something up. Jake Zink is our eBiz administrator. He's awesome. My contact information is there as well. And we've provided numbers for your district office. If you do not know who your inspector is, please contact your district office. We've had a lot of changes in staff and whatnot. They can help you reach out to them get a copy of your permit, but don't wait and don't struggle through this. I thank you all for attending the presentation and I hope that I could give you some more information that will reduce that compliance, that non-compliance and keep you in compliance. So thank you for attending. Jess, I'm gonna turn it back to you for now. Thank you, Donna. We're now going to answer some questions submitted during today's presentation with the remaining time. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to please go ahead and submit them through the question pane. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible, but if we do not get to your question, we will reach out to you via email after today's session. So Donna, our first question today is, if I did not discharge anything, do I still need to submit a DMR? That is a great question. 
And, and another way you can easily stay in compliance, even if you had no discharge, we don't know that. You have to tell us. So we don't assume anything. You have to open that DMR and click that no discharge box and submit. And that way we know that nothing went out the pipe. So yes, you do have to submit a DMR. Great, good to know. Thank you, Donna. Um, next up, we have a question about um, the process in place. Let's see, do I need to have a process in place for the owner of a facility to review the data and reports that I submit on their behalf? You know, I'm glad that you asked that question because, again, a lot of owners and corporate execs, they pass the buck, they hire somebody to do all this for them. Um, we highly recommend that you have a process in place to review your results, review your information with the owner. Again, they cannot completely pass the buck. It's not advisable because ultimately they are the ones responsible for compliance. So, I recommend that you set something up, meet with them, you know, once or twice a year or send them an email with a summary. Um, but it's really good that they stay in compliance because if we reach out to them or if there's enforcement, it's going to go to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Donna. Can more than one person report for the same facility? Absolutely. Great question. And we, again, we recommend that you have a backup. We get lots of calls of people scrambling to set up an EBIZ account because the person went on vacation or they left or they quit or got fired. Who knows? You can have as many people report for a facility as the legal permit holder wants to assign. So, yes, having more than one person is recommended. Great. Thank you. Um, does the owner of a facility need their own e-business center account? Yes, and, and I know I kind of harped on that in the presentation, but yes, when when you're setting up a facility um, and you're requesting EDMR service to, to do reports, ask the person who hired you if they have their own accounts. If they don't, tell them they need to set one up. Get our email address, send it to them. We will walk them through it. We do it all the time. It's going to make life a lot easier, especially because they have control um, or the power to assign EDMR service to you and you can skip the form. So it makes things a lot faster if they have their own accounts, especially when delegating privileges. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Donna. Um, just a couple more here. What happens if I do not see a DMR for my permit when I think that there should be one? The DMRs are created the beginning of the month and every once in a while because the digital universe is imperfect. <laughs> Sometimes there's a glitch or a hiccup. So it, it might mean that the DMR did not get created in that run. Um, and we can fix that. So reach out to us and ask. The other time that we see a DMR wasn't created is possibly if there are changes to your permit or you're in the middle of a modification or a renewal process. Those will sometimes cause a hang up between the previous version and the new version. Um, the bottom line is to keep submitting the DMRs that are available to you until the permit's updated. And most of all, don't wait, send us an email, reach out, give us a call, we can fix those things. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Donna. And another good one just came in. How do I know who is listed with EPA as my RO? A lot of people call us to ask that question. And because there can be more than one, it is up to you to find out who the responsible official is. I tell people, um, ask who is signing your check. It's, it's outlined in the regs who that person is. So you are looking for who owns the facility or who runs the facility. It, it, that person has to have a certain title and responsibility. So it's going to be the owner, the president, the CEO, the vice president. Um, if it's a public city or a village, it's going to be a council member or the mayor or a village administrator. It's up to you to determine who that person is. And that slide in the presentation gives the section of the regulations where you can find that definition and that title. Um, the regs are, are can be tedious. You have to read all of it because there's a lot of wiggle room on who that person can be. 
if you're not sure, ask the attorney for that facility or ask the legal counsel for the city. They will know and they will tell you who meets that criteria. Thank you, Donna. Um, do notifications of effluent violations have to be entered into streams by the RO? No, whoever is, is submitting the DMR will indicate whether or not there was an effluent violation. So it doesn't have to be a specific person that notifies. Great. All right, Donna, and I think that is all we have time for today. We have a couple of exit slides that we need to go through and we're getting short on time. So just a reminder, if we did not get to your question um, during the, the session here today, we will respond via email after the session. Before we end the session today, we would like to point your atten attention to another one of today's environmental fun facts. Ohio EPA congratulates Pitt, Ohio and Cleveland Metro Parks for receiving an Encouraging Environmental Excellence Award. Pitt, Ohio received E3 Gold Level for designing and building a LEED Gold office building and warehouse and operating at a net zero energy facility with solar and wind turbine powered microgrid. Cleveland Metro Parks received E3 Platinum Level for incorporating green building elements into multiple park buildings and operations, supporting green infrastructure within their park system, and investing more than $6.6 .6 million in environmental stewardship projects. You can scan the QR code on this slide to get more information about the E3 program and apply today. Ohio EPA hosts a series of webinars throughout the year on a variety of environmental topics. This slide provides information on how to register for these upcoming webinars, where to, where to find recordings of previous webinars, and how to sign up to receive notifications of upcoming webinars through our Ohio EPA Customer Support Center. Thank you again, Donna, for your great presentation, and thank you to our audience for attending this 2022 Virtual Compliance Assistance Conference session.